And welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled, How to Study Structural and Functional Properties of Tendon. This is Andy Henton from Inside Scientific, and it is my pleasure to be your host for today's event. Our session is sponsored by Aurora Scientific, and will focus on novel technology and associated methods for studying the structural and functional properties of tendon. First, we will be joined briefly by Matthew Borkowski, Sales and Support Manager at Aurora Scientific, located in Aurora, Ontario, Canada. Mr. Borkowski is a biomedical engineer and graduate of the University of Toronto. He has been involved in product design and customer support at Aurora Scientific for over 10 years and spends much of his time in the lab consulting with scientists, assisting with the application of Aurora Scientific instruments in various disciplines, including muscle, tendon, and connective tissue research. Today, Mr. Borkowski will briefly describe the engineering behind the multi-purpose Aurora Scientific dual mode lever, which serves as both a fast actuator and sensitive force transducer in one. In addition, he will briefly explain how this device can be used to, to uh, study tendon and other connective tissue. Following, we will be joined by Mr. Dylan Sarver, research associate in Dr. Chris Mendias' laboratory at the University of Michigan. Mr. Sarver studied biology and chemistry at Millersville University of Pennsylvania and athletic training at Westchester University of Pennsylvania. He is also a certified athletic trainer. His research foci are muscle and tendon physiology and related disease. Today, Mr. Sarver will discuss his current research focused on sex-related differences in the structural and functional status of tendon from macromolecular structural properties to, transcro to transcriptomic proteomic and cell biology of resident tendon fibroblasts. He will explain why tendon research is important, review methodology for investigating tendon structure and function, and discuss research findings supporting sex-related differences in tendon. I'd really like to thank, uh, thank you all for attending. Um, and just before I get started, I'd really like to thank my fellow presenter, uh, Dylan Sarver. Uh, uh, thanks for taking uh, taking the time um, out of your uh, out of your busy research schedule to be here with us, and of course our uh, our hosts uh, uh, Inside Scientific who always do a great job. Um, so my portion of the presentation uh, will focus on an overview of the equipment uh, that is used for mechanical testing of tendon and a brief introduction to how it works and the theory behind it. Uh, my colleague Dylan afterwards will be presenting some of his research and I think he's going to demonstrate how he integrated our equipment uh, into his own experimentation. So just before I get into the specifics of the equipment itself, I'd like to very briefly tell you a bit about Aurora Scientific. Uh, Aurora Scientific was founded in 1982 by two professors from the University of Toronto and we spent our early years as a small custom engineering and instrumentation firm. We worked on projects as diverse as blood rheology, uh, gas dispersion, micro seismics, um, you name it. Uh, since 1997, so about 20 years, uh, we have been serving the muscle mechanics research community. Uh, at that time, we began selling force transducers and fast actuators to look at the mechanical properties of muscle. Um, but as time went on, and due to our background in a diverse array of research discipline, um, our equipment has slowly found its way into material science and tensile testing of tendon and connective tissue. So specifically, the instrument which most commonly crosses over from muscle physiology into tendon or connective tissue is the dual mode lever system, which Andy very briefly introduced uh, a few minutes ago. So just to reiterate, the dual mode lever is what we would call a combination instrument. Uh, it has the ability to simultaneously measure force and a change in sample length. Um, the specifications of the instrument are tailored to characterize, uh, I guess you could say, the high performance nature of skeletal muscle uh, from humans and animal models. And uh, thus, it certainly satisfies the standard tensile testing needs 
um, for many other uh, passive types uh, of materials, such as connective tissue. Um, so that's great, but you know, how does it work? Um, the question that's on everybody's mind. Um, so let's take a closer look at uh, how this system works and each component that plays a role in the versatility. Um, so as I just said, uh, the system is based around this flagship instrument, the dual mode lever. Um, so we said that dual mode means it's a combo instrument. It's a force transducer, it's a position transducer as well. Um, but in addition to being able to measure force and position, it can also control either one of these parameters while simultaneously measuring the other. And it is able to flip back and forth instantaneously between which parameter you're controlling and which you're measuring. We know that um, uh, tension and length uh, are dependent variables. So we have this ability to control either one. Um, the system is also equipped with uh, a chamber for sample testing, um, and we have a full software suite for experimental control and analysis. Okay, so how does this so-called dual mode lever actually work? Uh, to briefly explain, the design of the instrument is based upon um, a servo motor, uh, and this servo motor has a very fast step response time. Um, the servo motor provides actuation, and thus it stretches and shortens the sample. Uh, it also has a very accurate position detector to provide feedbacks uh, as to its position at any given moment. So this is what we would call a closed loop system, um, as opposed to an open loop system which does not provide feedback. Um, we use this functionality uh, in combination with the electrical current that is drawn by the motor, since it's proportional to the load seen by the instrument. Um, this, therefore, provides us uh, what I think is a very elegant means of obtaining the instantaneous tensile force. Um, this roughly describes what is occurring when we issue a command to stretch or shorten a tendon preparation. We, we give some signal to the servo motor, uh, it stretches or shortens, and we're measuring the tensile force during that command by analyzing the current that's coming from the motor. Um, the electronics which control the instrument, though, have another mode uh, where we are controlling the tensile load of the sample. Uh, we might call this um, uh, you know, an isotonic condition. Um, it's, it's basically a force control mode. So this allows us instead to measure the profile of the tendon shortening based upon uh, a loading profile which is user defined. We can input this profile to the instrument in the form of some command signal, uh, an external voltage, rather than driving a length change to try to mimic um, some sort of load curve. So uh, we have lever systems um, to kind of give you an idea of, of you know, the specifications we're, we're working with here, uh, which can accommodate tensile loads of anywhere up to 100 newtons. Um, and uh, at that level, we have an actuation distance greater than five centimeters. Um, however, uh, the resolution of all the instruments, um, I guess the whole family of dual mode levers, is on the order of millinewtons uh, for force and microns for positioning. So quite precise. Uh, additionally, um, the motors that are used with each lever system variant, uh, they all, as I mentioned, have a very rapid step response times, um, which means that it's possible to try to model extremely fast stretches of tendon tissue and thus potentially model the type of loading uh, seen um, during a catastrophic injury, for instance. Um, e this in conjunction with the functionality to control the tensile load of the tendon um, with some user-driven uh, load profile makes this a very powerful tool, in my opinion, 
to try and model more complicated physiological situations that we see in real life, um, aside from just measuring um, a, a, a very simple stress versus strain. Uh, so previously I mentioned the maximum tensile limit of the instrument. Uh, our biggest instrument would be about 100 newtons. This is certainly sufficient to work with ligaments and tendons from uh, mouse and rat models. Um, some animals, uh, perhaps larger than rats, could also be accommodated by these systems. However, it would never be suitable for whole human tendons or really large samples um, from, uh, from large animal models. Um, so while the lever system is, is clearly versatile enough to work with a wide variety of tissue types and samples, it's not a complete replacement for a material testing system. It's, uh, it works very well with, um, with certain samples, but it's not designed uh, to do everything. Uh, the unit is an active control system, so all samples have to have some degree of compliance and elasticity. Uh, so it's not suitable for loading and compression or applying tensile loading to extremely stiff materials like bone. Um, the lever system's control electronics require an analog voltage control signal. Um, this is nice because it's open, um, but you need to typically pair it with some sort of software, maybe LabVIEW, to facilitate programming of stretches, um, slacks, and loading profiles. Uh, additionally, since the lever system is an actuator and a force transducer in one, and thus has a single point of attachment, um, we typically, with the system, provide some simple chambers and mounts um, to try to make sample testing as turnkey as possible. Uh, so moving right on here to talk a little bit about uh, the rest of the system. Um, the experimental apparatus is perhaps the least complex portion of the system, but it would be difficult to, uh, to do the experiment without it. So all cha chambers are designed um, to have the option of being temperature controlled by passive water circulation. Uh, certain tissues may not be suitable for testing at room temperature. Uh, we have an optional flow through system, um, usually used for oxygenation of living tissues, but could be used to load the chamber with some sort of drug or compound or reagent, uh, which might change mechanical properties of the sample. Um, both the motor mount and the tissue mount post are coupled to micropositioners, and this is to simplify sample alignment and preparation. Um, and in the case of some of the small samples, which people are typically working with, uh, tendons from mice, for instance, this really assists to ensure that tensile loading is applied perfectly axially. Uh, small temple samples, uh, tendon samples, are typically sutured, uh, however, we have a number of fixation clamps, and we do have the capability to work on custom holders if, uh, if people need it. Uh, so, although the lever system uh, and the system in general is, is pretty powerful, it would not be useful without a comprehensive software package to turn um, experiments into a proper set of instructions for the instrument. Uh, so, we've uh, written a software package called uh, DMC, um, and this is what you would use to acquire all the data from uh, from from your experiment. Uh, so to write the protocols themselves, there are these canned functions uh, within the software for various stretches and slacks and muscle tension control. Um, all that you really require uh, to turn an experiment into an instruction set is to type in a few of the timing parameters uh, into the canned function that you want to execute. Um, as long as the timing is known, the software will synchronize all the stretches for you. Uh, additionally, uh, the software suite was written with mechanical loading experiments in mind, originally for muscle. Um, however, because of this, we've programmed, pre-programmed in a whole library of standard protocols uh, for the most common experiment types that could be performed. Uh, to get started, you kind of simply load a protocol from the library, and you can use it as a framework to customize um, the parameters uh, that you need for, for your tissue sample. Uh, this whole package was designed to make mechanical experiments simple. 
So once the tendon or other piece of connective tissue is attached, load the protocol that you've pre-written and press start to begin collecting the data. The software controls all the timing and lets you monitor the loading experiment in real time. So uh, as we all know, um, data analysis, uh, I'm sure this has happened to all of us uh, in the past, where the analysis has taken much longer than actually collecting the data itself. Um, uh, that's uh, something uh, near and dear to all of our hearts, I'm sure, uh, and we didn't want that to be the case uh, uh, on our watch, so to speak. Um, so we've written this complementary uh, analysis package called DMA, which allows for visualization, plotting, and analysis of all the raw traces that you're collect collecting through DMC. So with tendon mechanic experiments, um, we're often collecting large data sets, uh, many repetitive stretches and slacks, and from many animals or samples. So these loading experiments can take a really long time to analyze on their own. So we've written this sub-module in the program for high throughput analysis. Um, basically, uh, the high throughput are these pre-written scripts which will help analyze stiffness, passive tensile properties, uh, work loops, amongst many others, um, which are based on driving length changes um, uh, or driving um, uh, a known load. Um, the analysis is presented in an, a very easy to read table. You can directly export it to Excel. Uh, and unless you're working with tens of thousands of files, um, the, the script runs through uh, in under, uh, usually under a minute. Um, so just before I, I kind of wrap up here, um, uh, we've learned a little bit about the, um, the system, uh, about the lever and how it works and some of these supporting pieces. Um, but I just kind of briefly wanted to uh, throw this up here to touch on, on some of the standard kind of mechanical loading protocols we can perform. So um, standard tensile ex experiments, uh, such as stress versus strain, uh, elastic modulus, um, that can all be performed in this um, uh, actuation or length control mode that I described. Um, similarly, destructive testing and thus obtaining yield and ultimate braking stress um, can be performed in this actuation mode according to any strain rate that you so desire. Um, so thanks to the excellent response time of the instrument, as I mentioned before, we can apply um, uh, stretches or slacks uh, for instance, like high frequency sinusoids um, to assess uh, stiffness. Uh, we can uh, measure stress relaxation with really excellent temporal resolution. And this is all thanks to these fast, um, fast actuators, the servo motors. Uh, also, um, as previously uh, mentioned, uh, we can hold tension in the, in the tendon constant and measure a length change driven uh, by some uh, user-defined um, uh, load or force pro profile. Um, so this can be as simple as a step change in force or modeled on real-life physiological data. All right, so I guess I'll do a, I had a series of nice introductions prior, but just as a reiteration, my name is Dylan. I'm a research associate at the University of Michigan in Chris Mendez's lab. We're very interested in uh, muscle and tendon physiology, as well as the biological basis for injury. So it makes sense that the work I'm going to show you today falls right in line with that. So this is a study that I did when I initially got here, uh, looking at sex-based differences in tendon composition and mechanical properties. So first, I think it's important to talk about tendon structure and function before we get on to any of the data. So tendons organized, it's usually not appreciated quite like muscle is, but it's organized in a very similar manner in which smaller fibrils are bundled together to make more and more functional units. These fibers are primarily made of fibrillar collagens, uh, type 1 and 3, and network collagens, type 4 and 6. This tissue is largely hypocellular and consists of the tendon resident fibroblasts as the primary cell population. So a little more about the structure. Collagen type 1 and 3 are primarily there to resist these longitudinal forces. 
and then type four and six of these network collagens that help resist forces, lateral forces, and in all directions. When we add these together, we can produce a functional collagen fiber, which can, produce, which can primarily resist force in the longitudinal axis, but is strong all over. Now, as we start adding these together, we can produce bundles and increase the organization. So we wrap that in a protective layer. And then we start bundling those together and we get a more and more highly organized tissue, often not appreciated uh, in the tendon. But it's not complete without something there uh, to maintain the tissue. Therefore, we have these tendon resident fibroblasts, which take care of the, of the, uh, largely, uh, the, the large protein composition of the tendon. So tendon is primary, uh, tendon is very important for locomotion. So the muscle produces force, and the tendon efficiently transfers that force to the bone to produce movement. Here are some nice in-house images that I've taken before of some healthy longitudinal sections, staying with uh, the top one, staying with H and E, hematoxylin, eosin, eosin staining connective tissue, and the H, um, the hematoxylin, the purple staining uh, the cell nuclei. So you can see uh, further accented in this polarized image, uh, this polarized image of the same exact tissue and the same spot, you can see that 3D kind of crimping, which is characteristic of, of healthy tendon. With physiological loading, we expect some positive adaptations to the tendon, such as increased energy storage, peak stress and strain, increased uh, cross-sectional area of the tendon, as well as fibroblast density. Now, sometimes things don't go according to plan, and unfortunate instances can happen, such as a tendon rupture. So as you can see on the image to the left, we have an Achilles tendon rupture, and just to the right of that, we have a biceps brachii tendon rupture. You can also have tendonitis, such as medial epicondylitis, lateral epicondylitis, patellar tendonitis. These are these acute uh, inflammatory bouts, which unfortunately sometimes turn into tendinosis, a more chronic, a uh, more chronic issue of the tendon in this uh, characterized as this, this aberrant uh, dysfunctional uh, tendon unit. So now to prompt this study, epidemiological studies have shown that Achilles tendon rupture is more common in males and that females have an increased burden associated with tendon injury during that rehabilitation and recovery period. But we don't really know the biological basis for this, something our lab is very interested in, especially in relation to muscle and tendon. So why is it, is it due to uh, some sort of mechanical deficiency, uh, a cell biology uh, difference between the two, some sort of protein difference, or is it genetic in nature? Therefore, it makes sense that the study of this, uh, or the purpose of this study, was to evaluate sex-based differences in tendon. We wanted to look at the mechanics, cell biology, the proteomics, and gene expression between these two. To do this, we used C57 black six mice, basically wild-type mice, uh, both male and female, and we isolated both the plantaris and Achilles tendon for either RNA isolation, mechanical testing, histology, proteomic analysis, uh, or some sort of uh, gene expression. So, Something I, I won't show here, but I'll give a link to later in the full paper. Uh, we also isolated collagen from the, ten, uh, from the tails, uh, tail tendons, to, get, uh, to do a couple cell autonomy and non-cell autonomous um, tests in their fibroblasts. So if you're interested in that, you know, please check out the paper. So look at the histology. So these are two cross sections of Achilles tendons, male on the left, female on the right. And you can see the stain WGA DAPI, WGA being green, staining extracellular matrix, and the DAPI being in blue, uh, staining the cell nuclei. From this quantification, we can see that males seem to have a greater Achilles cross-sectional area. Not huge, but it is significant. And the females seem to have a greater cell density, uh, similar in magnitude as compared to the, uh, the males. So, to dig deeper into the mechanics, as this was a bulk of the study, and this, the mechanics are largely in, this, in the viscoelastic realm of this tissue, so we weren't rupturing any tissue. I, I wasn't as interested in that as I was in how this tendon can stretch and then recover. 
So I, I see this as the physiologic, as a physiologically important uh, area. So instead of just ripping it, I really wanted to see how it recovers. So maybe it could relate to that which we see in muscle contraction and daily locomotion. So a setup much like this, and which I can zoom in, which we have this servomotor force transducer that Matt had talked about earlier, and a stationary hook. And then from that, I will suture in this very, very tiny plantaris tendon uh, from a mouse. So we have the calcaneal end to the left, the tendon body in the middle, and then the more proximal myotendinous area uh, to the right, which is sutured to the stationary hook. And to the right, we can see some representative stress strain curves that we get from a stretch such as this, and then also a recovery graph uh, showing the percent of initial load retained uh, through our fatigue graph through that uh, 300 cycles of unloading, uh, loading and unloading. So the first thing we have to do is find the cross-sectional area because we will normalize this to get to get uh, to a normalized force to cross-sectional area to get the stress, uh, which is important to compare across species, across sizes, and across samples. So here uh, to the left, I have a rat tendon, uh, which I'm working on optimizing now in this system. Uh, so this is a little bit bigger, so I was hoping this would, uh, this would help you guys out. But to the right of that, you can see the really tiny couple of hairs in uh, diameter that I was actually working with, uh, the mouse plantaris tendon. So this is in this prism device, which has, if this being a cross section of it, if the tendon was in the middle, uh, being the yellow, uh, the yellow oval, and the 45 degree slants on the sides as these, as these uh, mirrors. So what I can do is take a camera, take an image from the top and get diameter one, and maybe and produce an image that looks like this. And then I can move that to the side and take an image off that mirror and get diameter two, which would look like this. Then from those, I can take five evenly spaced points through the area that I'm, I'm primarily concerned with. And I can get an approximation, I can use those and get an approximation to calculate cross-sectional area. So okay, so we've isolated the tendon, we've measured the cross-sectional area, and now we need to start tying it for the rig. So from here, the first thing I wanna do is after I've cleared off the extra tendon, just past the myoten or the extra muscle just past the myotendinous junction, I'll tie a suture just at the end of the myotendinous junction. So that way, because I'm primarily concerned with this tendon body. Now from there, I'll tie another, uh, I'll tie a box knot, so I'll, I'll lock that knot in place, and I'll ready a knot here. I'll stick a plastic spacer in, and then I will loop that excess tendon back on itself. So this will this will act as the uh, the loop that will go around the stationary hook uh, that I showed you earlier. Now I'll tie that on itself, make sure that's tight with the box knot, and then I'm ready for the next step. So I need to get this after I've tied now the calcaneal side as well, and I need to hook that up onto this device. So the first thing I do is I tie the calcaneal side to the servomotor force transducer, and then I'm going to use my forceps and slide that tendinous loop off of the spacer, that plastic spacer, and onto the stationary hook. Now that I have that, I'll take this excess suture up at the top towards the stationary hook, and I'll make an extra little uh, safety knot around that, so that way we get as, as minimal movement in that side as possible. And that's what gets us up to here. So now all tied up, I have, I have two videos that I think are, are pretty nice, but uh, so this one to the left is showing a 10% stretch, uh, so this is 10% strain, and to the right will show uh, side by side a 20% strain. So you can see it's, it's very minimal movement, uh, but we can get so much information from that. Something that I really like that you can see from the uh, 20% is the recovery, some of the viscoelastic properties that actually happen. So as you can see right here, you can see it's stretched and you can actually watch the tendon recover back to its initial length. So this is, this is really interesting. Now from this, uh, so I used in this study a 10% strain and I did that over 300 uh, loading cycles. 
So from something like that, I, I, I was able to obtain a graph much like this. Uh, so from this, we, we, can, we can get a, a, a ton of information from. So here being the toe-in region, this initial kind of almost like an exponential increase, this toe-in region is an area of molecular organization. So this is where the tendon unit is organizing as appropriately as possible to best resist that deformation, that stress, uh, that strain. So now that moves up, this toe-in region moves into this linear region in which everything should be optimally lined up and now it's producing uh, the maximum amount of stress that it can at a given strain. So from a graph like this, we can pull a number of, a, a number of different uh, data points from. So we can see that we can get the peak stress. Now this is not total, but this is peak stress for 10% strain. Uh, we can compare that across, across different groups. And we can also take a point and we can draw a line to that. And we can get the, if this were a stress strain curve, we get tangent modulus. And basically we can find the slope of this linear region and start to understand the tendon stiffness. Now, if we take that a little bit further, we can use this loading cycle uh, and find the area under the curve, representing that elastic energy uh, stored during the stretch. Now, if we unload that, we can see how much energy is returned during the stretch. So from this hysteresis, we can, we can subtract the two areas under the curve and find the elastic energy lost represented as the area within the curve. So this gives us an understanding of the overall tendon efficiency. So now coming back to these, maybe they make a little bit more sense, these being uh, representative images of our stress strain curves from uh, the sex differences study, males being shown in black and females being shown in gray. So you can see this, this toe-in region here, and then it starts to linearize as here, here being our peak force, and then coming down in our unloading curve. And again, we can take the areas under those curves, subtract them, and get the area within the curve to see uh, the differences in tendon efficiency. Now, hopefully what you can appreciate from both this graph and this fatigue graph, this retention of initial load, you can see that male and female tendons are remarkably similar in their uh, viscoelastic properties. So now moving into actual data, males being represented as blue and females being represented as green here. Uh, when we compare load in cycle number at 1, 20, 50, 100, 300 stretch, uh, and the stress in cycle number, we can see that male and female tendons do not significantly differ uh, in their load and stress production. Now, something different, uh, the histology I showed earlier was in the Achilles tendon. What we see here using this PRISM device, uh, which we believe to be fairly precise, is that the plantaris tendon cross-sectional area does not seem to differ uh, between male and female. So this may be different uh, from tendon to tendon. And we also see that the length does not significantly differ. Also, when you take this uh, percent of initial stress graph down here at the bottom and you graph the standard deviation over top of it, again, you see how the uh, male is completely contained within the female. So again, from taking these to find tangent modulus, taking this point and drawing a line to that to get that to under, uh, on a stress strain curve to start to understand uh, the, the tendon stiffness at our given stress, our given strain. We can see that across one to 300 cycles, they're very similar. However, females do seem to be trending slightly uh, as a slightly stiffer matrix. The energy loss between the two, so that area within the curve, uh, seems to be remarkably similar between the two. Now, with this, when you're looking at, you know, when you're looking at tendons, something that is composed almost entirely of, uh, of protein, you know, and the few cells that it has in there, uh, it's really important to look at the protein composition as well, because it, it, there may be some sort of compensation that, that doesn't uh, arise clearly in the, in the mechanical findings. So I really like to accent that with a proteomic check. So with a great group at the University of Liverpool, we were able to compare both the male and female proteome. So when we look at this, we see that the primary collagens and structural components of the tendon, uh, both male and female, seem to be very similar. However, it's these non-structural ten, uh, protein, tendon proteins that seem to be different, fibronectin, periosin, and tenacin. So this is interesting in that all these are uh, postulated to, to alter uh, the recovery process. 
and because they're all almost twofold higher in female, this may give some sort of indication as to that clinical finding prior in which females have this decreased burden uh, or this increased burden associated with, with tendon injury repair. So it may be that maybe these, um, uh, these proteins play an interesting role in that, in that in, uh, clinical finding. So the conclusions that we can draw from just the data I'm showing you now, uh, female Achilles tendons have smaller cross-sectional area and higher uh, cell density than males. Non-destructive mechanical testing shows no differences between the sexes. And the proteome of male and female tendons are very similar in structural proteins, but very interestingly seem to differ in fibronectin, periosin, and tenacin C, all higher, almost twofold, in the female tendon. So now if you want any sort of, uh, if you want to dig deeper into this study, we did many, many more things looking at whole tendon gene expression, uh, the transcriptome of the two, and many uh, cell culture studies looking at uh, cell autonomous and non-cell autonomous action of tendon resident fibroblasts. Please check out this, uh, uh, check out my publication, Sex Differences in Tendon Structure and Function, uh, published in the Journal of Orthopedic Research. There's a link provided in this bottom left right here. So with that being said, a special thank you to everyone in the Mendias lab who's helped me a ton, Chris, John, uh, Chris, James, another Chris, Andrew, and Jeff. And then the Brooks lab, Sue Brooks lab is, is great. Sue Brooks, Dennis, and Carol, all very knowledgeable people. And then of course, the University of Liverpool people, uh, both Ethna and Yalda for really helping with the proteomics side of things. All right, so first question, Matt, uh, you brought this up at the beginning of your presentation, but can you maybe rehash some of the specific limitations, for example, uh, the sample size or sample compliance when using this system for stress strain assays? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you guys a, a bit of a background. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the lever system is an active control system. Um, uh, it's what we would call I guess, driven by a PID loop. Um, so if you couple a load to it, uh, which does not have some compliance, um, it basically sees the sample, um, a stiff sample as a dead load. Um, and the loop, the control loop is not tuned for this load. So um, without elasticity in the sample, um, your 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 control loop is is not tuned or not closed uh, properly, um, and you can have uh, oscillations basically on your signal. So um, samples must be compliant, as I mentioned. Um, so uh, things that are very stiff, uh, like bone, thick pieces of cartilage, um, any. Um, any non-living materials uh, 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 that people might do, you know, engineering type of tensile testing on, um, uh, you know, metal implants or, or, or something like that, they're not suitable for, um, for this system. Um, uh, similarly, you wouldn't do uh, uh, sort of compressive uh, uh, testing on, uh, on samples. Uh, this is primarily intended for tensile testing. Um, now, um, just to touch on um, size of sample, obviously the larger the cross-sectional area of a sample, um, as you stretch it, uh, the, more, um, the more tension it will produce. Um, we have an upper limit of, of, of 100 newtons. So uh, a sample uh, such as a human tendon um, uh, would be way too large. Um, you would you would certainly certainly exceed the limit of the instruments, and uh, you'd uh, uh, you'd likely be considerably too stiff as well. Um, so we're looking we're looking primarily at um, small, um, typically smaller diameter samples from 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 animal models. Now, um, Dylan might have a bit of experience taking. Uh, larger samples and com compartmentalizing them into smaller um, subunits and testing them that way. Uh, 
but uh, really, I think if you're if you're dealing with a large sample, that would be um, that would be your 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 only approach um, to overcoming this uh, uh, you know this this elasticity and 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 upper limit of tension. Yeah. So just to add on to that, I would agree. Um, the larger the tendon can can definitely be tougher, uh, but definitely not impossible. Uh, too stiff can be an issue, but if you break these things down into smaller and smaller units, as I was showing the buildup of a tendon uh, and basic structure of a tendon, you can break down this this large this large unit into smaller fascicles. And if you do that appropriately, you should be able to cement them back together and get an understanding of of the whole. So uh, th that's why normalizing the cross-sectional area in your data can be uh, pretty effective. Well, that's great. Very complete answer, both you guys. Thank you. Um, all right, next question uh, for you, Dylan. Is there any particular reason that in this particular um, or in this specific study that you uh, omitted destructive testing? Um, and can you comment on that? Yeah, so I, I think destructive testing is important. However, a bulk of the tendon uh, data out there, I would say, is destructive testing. So the thing that I really liked about this, what it added in a, in a new way from a new angle, is these viscoelastic properties are very important to physiology. So it's, it's things that are happening every time we walk. Uh, things. This is the sort of movement that happens uh, when we exercise, etc. So for me, I felt it very physiologically relevant to test these in a in a sort of physiological realm. So I wanted to see them stretch as something that hopefully would relate to normal function. Uh, and for that reason, I did this this sort of uh, viscoelastic uh, investigation. Perfect. And actually, on the uh, tone of uh, destructive testing, uh, Hani has asked um, if there's any issues with slippage um, in destructive testing, or have you seen any issues with, you know, quote unquote, slippage? I'm assuming uh, Dylan and Matt, you might know what Hani's referring to. Sure, slippage of the sample, I would imagine. Um, uh, it, it, this is this is something you really um, uh, you really have to. Um, uh, prepare for when you're when you're when you're mounting your sample. I mean, Dylan, you probably have more hands-on experience uh, than I do, but um, uh, I mean, we see this across an array of tissues: tendon, um, muscle, uh, uh, you name it. And uh, I mean, often people are um, double and triple uh, suturing or folding, you know, an end. Uh, uh, of, of a of a sample over and then re-nodding. So um, I mean, you've almost got uh, uh, the 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 tensile load in two parallel branches of the knot. Um, some people, um, you know, when the load gets really high, we have one uh, system where people will actually take a physical clamp um, and uh, clamp the sample. Um, screwed down into one end um, to uh, to limit uh, the chance of uh, uh, of slippage. Um, this is uh, uh, you know this is this is one of these things also that it really depends on the nature of your sample. Everybody's sample is a um, is a little bit different. Um, they're 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 not quite alike. So there are these best practice things I've kind of mentioned that you can do. Um, but uh, ultimately, um, there needs to be a bit of, uh, of of trial and error, I guess you could say, to find out. Okay, you know, these are my samples. What do I need to do to make sure that um, that this isn't going to slip? But it's uh, it's something that I'm sure is on everybody's mind. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. That's yeah. So important. yeah, go ahead, Dylan. Continue. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I would just agree to relate to the the hands-on. Uh, part of it, this is why the mouse tendon, I, I've been able to successfully break mouse tendons um, with this setup, uh, just with, with sutures. It's, it, you know, talking about the difference between, and now this is mouse plantaris tendon too, so you're, you're basically finding the smallest tendon that you can, but, uh, you know, and looking at these tendons, and I usually try to break them to make sure 
uh, even in my non-destructive testing, just to make sure that everything is taught and that my setup is effective. So I don't want any sort of slippage or anything, and that's why I will break them prior to uh, an actual go at a study. But but the sutures can be quite effective, and as Matt alluded to, the the grips for higher loads, as I'm seeing now with a lot of the uh, uh, the rat plantaris tending that the plantaris testing that I'm doing in this setup, uh, the grips have been hugely effective. Perfect. Very good. Um... A question from Venus, just um, there's interest in the specific size of suture thread that you use, Dylan, uh, during the surgical procedure images that you shared. Um, I usually use gauge four or six. Uh, it, it really depends, though. Too big, uh, I don't think grips as nicely. Uh, however, too small will break. So I usually try and take I try and get as small as possible because I think it it bites the tendon, it really grips the tendon uh, better than the larger, um, and creates a much tighter knot. So slipping is is less likely. Um, but I match that with you know the the amount of force I expect to produce because that's going to change um, with with the uh, the suture or with the tendon that you're the material that you're testing. So. So it really depends, but usually with, with my applications, anywhere from four to six is uh, pretty normal. Okay, great, great. Um, I think, um, Matt, this would be a question for you. Uh, Michael Rosario has asked is it, if it is possible to switch load control mid-test, and he's providing an example. Uh, could they apply a certain strain and maintain the stress at that strain for the remainder of the test? So basically what you'd like to do is you'd like to um, begin, um, what it sounds like is you'd begin um, uh, stretching uh, the sample. So you're applying strain and then once you reach a predefined stress, uh, hold it there um, and, 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 and basically uh, uh, let, you know, let the strain do what it will at that point. Um, the answer is yes. Um, that's 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 quite simple. I mean, it, it, you can you can even with um, you know this isn't specifically done with the software I talked about, but we have another software package where you can sort of sample the load in real time, um, and when it, it you know even if you don't know um, uh, 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 kind of um, exactly uh, what that load is going to be. You could say, okay, I've issued strain for a certain amount of time, um, and once I've issued this much strain, the load may be different, but I can still sample and hold it. Um, so that's that's something that, that that can be done with the instrument. Yes, perfect. Um, another question: What is the minimum size or length of a tendon that could be used in this apparatus? Um, Finosh has asked this and is working with uh, a shoulder tendon sample from rats and imagines it would be two to three millimeters in length. Is, is that going to be suitable? Uh, in, in my experience, um, I think that would be, that would be perfectly reasonable. Um, I mean, I'm not sure what the exact structure um, or shape of the of the sh of the you know the shoulder tendon what it looks like exactly compared to you know say Dylan's plantaris mm -hmm. um, you know and how much kind of real estate you have where perhaps you know you have a bit of calcification on either end to tie or suture off or grip to but um, two to three millimeters of, of I guess you know sample length we could we could call it um, to me, seems sufficient. Um, uh, you know, I, I think Dylan, your your plantaris ones were on the order of five to six, I think. Yeah. So the plantaris, the plantaris was an ideal location because it was uh, long enough and very skinny, easy to dissect out. Um, the the shoulder that that size seems reasonable. It seems like it could be a uh, just a bit tricky, but you you always have at least some sort of bony insertion, so that that makes one side very easy because attaching the bony side is 
very rigid and, and easy to maintain throughout the whole testing. The other side becomes a little trickier. So with the, with the I'm not sure which shoulder muscle it is, but if it was, um, you know, a, a cuff muscle or, or maybe the deltoid uh, tendon that you're talking about or something, um, you, the, the bonus of my plantaris testing was I had a long, uh, like a, you know, a four to six millimeter tendon, but then also a little bit of an extension into the muscle. So I could scrape away this long muscle, I could scrape away that muscle and get some sort of tendinous flap that I could use as a loop to loop back on itself. Um, with that sort of setup, if it sounds a little, um, you like you'll have one bony side and then the other side will be trickier, it may just be a matter of either finding the tendon that you can, uh, getting it to go out as long as possible, and then maybe gripping uh, at a certain point. Maybe that seems reasonable in that circumstance.